In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Gracious and most merciful God, you have revealed your Son Jesus to us, and we have embraced him as Lord and Savior. Yet others continue to try and make him relevant to their particular context. So this afternoon, as we reflect, we pray, O oh God, that our ideas may sound and reveal truth, so that as we wrestle with who Jesus is, he may be real to us, now and forevermore. Amen. Now, this is not typical lecture style that we would have had with the church we love. This particular lecture will be, in a, will be two parts. Part one today, which will cover who are the ancestors. And this will be done by referencing work of various writers. And they have some brief thoughts on what that means for who Jesus is and what we do as church. And on the 7th of June, we'll continue part two by looking at how our understanding of who Jesus is and the ancestors affects what we do and implications, in this case, for beyond the African context. And so the first part of this lecture presupposes an African context and will move to look at ways and means whereby what is applicable there can have influence beyond. Now one of the things that we have come to know and understand is that the history of Christianity has been an attempt to place a face on the facelessness of Jesus from the moment he entered the world of great thought. Every age struggles with who Jesus is. As a group and as individuals. Because who Jesus is determines so much in terms of what we do, don't do, how we worship and don't worship. And the answer is always contextual. Over time, some areas have been able to make their answers normative. Gabriel Sistelon in 1979 asserts, the next task of African theology is to seriously grapple with the question of Christology, who Jesus is. What does Messiahship and Christos mean in the African context. And so in the 1980s, African Christian theology got connected to Christology and has sought to new heights ever since. For those who want their suspicions mostly, most often unspoken, but sometimes not confirmed, that African Christian theology is of little intellectual, let alone theological consequence, need to think again. African Christian theology initial breakthrough, the interrogation of African experience and existence is being watered. The notion of the ancestors in the African worldview finds itself subjected to interrogation with implications for Christology, that is who Jesus is, ecclesiology, who we are as church, and ethics, what we do as individual and as church. Who Jesus is determines the way we think of God and the way we express our Christianity. 
Robert D. Jameson concludes an analysis of Western and Eastern Christological formulation by pointing out that the story told by the gospel is the story of God determining who and what sort of God he is. And that finally is why so much rhymes on who this man Jesus is. John Mabiti clearly indicates the importance of Christology for his theological formulations. In any case, he says, the final test for the validity and usefulness of any theological contribution is Jesus Christ. Hence, it is critical for us to determine how applicable is the African understanding of ancestors to Jesus and its effects on the expression of our Christianity. And so let us briefly review what theologians are saying about the ancestors via who are the ancestors. Ancestors in the African context are loosely referred to as living dead in the absence of a more precise term. It denotes an idea that death is not annihilation and or even separation. The ancestors are considered as living members of the community. They are responsible for channeling the life force within the community and thus impact the vitality of the community. In other words, there is a continuous existence. Ancestors are treated as one of the family, although at times they appear fickle and unpredictable. Consequently, it is vital that ancestors should not be displeased. Moreover, their experience as presence through various rituals and dreams, not simply as memory. Kwame Bidiako may disagree. He states, the persistence of the cult of ancestors is owed not to their demonstrable power to act, but to the power of the myth that sustains them in the corporate mind of the community. Bidiako makes the point that ancestral spirits cannot presume to act in the way tradition ascribes to them. The notion of sacrament may help in the distinction. But even this notion of sacramental is Christian color. Since in Africa, in African traditional worldview, no distinction exists between the sacred and the secular the religious and the non-religious one. So one must also note that African traditional worldview has no concept of heaven and hell, as does Christianity. But ancestors are thought to be closer to the Supreme Being. In general, therefore, their continuing relationship with their family as medical, financial, moral, biological, and social implications for the living. Charles Yamamati suggests five categories for understanding the functions of ancestors. These include kinship. African ancestorship can be parental, brotherly, sisterly, and even tribal. Human, superhuman status. Thanks to death, an ancestor enjoys certain superhuman capabilities and a sacred relationship to the living king. Third, mediation. The African ancestor is frequently, though not always, seen as the mediator between the descendants and the supreme being. Four, Exemplary. In African culture, 
No one can enjoy ancestral status without having led a morally good life. And five, the right to sacred communication. Thanks to familial status and superhuman state, an African ancestor is believed to have special entitlement to regular sacred communication with the descendants in the form of prayer, ritual offerings, which signifies love, homage, and thanksgiving. For Nayamiti, an analogous engagement with these categories has implications for Christology, ecclesiology, and ethics. Presently, there is no definitive position on the ancestors in African theology. All theologians do not agree on the precise nature of our relationship with ancestors. Moreover, among theologians, this agenda is extremely delicate and it is difficult to generalize, as varied concepts exist across different groups. Additionally, there are few biblical passages concerning relationships with the dead. Some writers opine that Christians must reflect critically on some traditional notions about ancestors. This includes the notion that ancestors have physical power over living family members. Moreover, Christians must emphatically deny that ancestors cause deaths and divination, a primary preoccupation of the ancestral cult and that it is entirely unacceptable. However, with these reservations, many theologians embrace or adapt traditional beliefs about ancestors. In developing a Christian theology that speaks to the African understanding of ancestors, these theologians are confident that their insights would enrich worldwide Christianity. And so I'm going to look at four theologians and their work and their particular perspective. First is Peter N. Nawachuki. In his study of Igbo religion and its relationship to Christianity, he made several observations. He follows the tradition of persons like Leon Kato, that sees a cleavage between Christianity and African traditional religion. For him, he discounts any ancestral role for Jesus in the Igbo religion. Therefore, there could be no Christological formulation there. He proclaims, we feel that the Christological form formulation which suggests models for African Christ are inadequate and sometimes misleading. Those models include Christ as king, Christ as elder brother, Christ as healer, Christ as ancestor, Christ as liberator and warrior. Some apparent dangers for the authentic Christian faith in Africa exist in those models. In many instances, there are African communities where people have suffered oppression, suppression, injustice, and all kinds of deprivation from the hands of their fellow Africans who are to assume these positions in society. Many Africans will be hesitant to give their allegiance and loyalty to a Christ who assumes any of those positions. Christ is a unique personality. The uniqueness of this personality should be preserved even in the process of cross-cultural communication of the gospel. Further, he discounts any notion that ancestors are worshipped in Igbo land. He makes the point in Igbo land, 
Ancestors are respected and sometimes defined, but not worshipped. The fact that most Western anthropologists and even theologians, as well as some African ones, talk about ancestral worship does not mean that Africans, especially the Igbo, worship their ancestors. Now, Atuki concedes that other Christological titles, including Savior and Liberator, can be applied within the African context. He agrees with Enyamati on the mediation role, but he refers to it as intercessory and protection. Though a review of the literature in this piece suggests that he holds a minority position. The other writer is a European, Andrew Wall. Andrew Walls operates primarily from within a Western Christian framework, though he is sympathetic to the African endeavors. And because he operates from within a Western Christian framework, it colors his concept of ancestors. He betrays this with reference to deceased Christians. He says, Christian faith therefore necessarily ancestors consciously aware of the previous generation of faith. It cannot divinize the ancestors, however, for their continuing significance comes only from God's activity in and towards them. Kwame Bidiapo contends that in the African context, ancestors are the product of making imagination of the community. The struggle is essentially here. They stand at different angles, looking at the same issue of death. How can one then discredit or credit the ancestors and suggest that it is incompatible? Or is it most probably the case that walls and PDR operate from within different worldviews? Francis Cavaselli makes this useful distinction. Bantu ancestors are not dead, but alive. This, with perhaps a bit of exaggeration, is the whole difference between the European ancestor and the Bantu. The former is memory, the latter is presence. Walls is convinced that there is no similar equivalent in the West, either of ancestors or the clan lineage system to which the ancestors belong. Consequently, he is uneasy about the close relationship between God and the ancestors. Perhaps one can understand, do not accept the missionaries' confrontational attitude towards Africa's pre-Christian past. However, more importantly for us is Wall's sense of the pervasiveness of the ancestors in the African's life. This leads him to suggest that they cannot be ignored. His solution is to defer any speculation leading towards a synchrony of ancestors and Christ. He writes, if a new form of Christianity is emerging, shaped by the configuration of African life, it will bound to take account in some way of the ancestors. In other words, he suggests that the notion of ancestors and Christ be left for the future. Naturally, this is not acceptable at several levels. The ancestral system is exalting its influence now. Africans are wrestling with who they are as Christians now. Furthermore, an assessment of the compatibility of ancestors with historic Christianity 
needs a creative synergy to sustain the shift of gravity. Clearly, it is in the present that the path has to be forged for the continuous dialogue between African traditional religion and African Christian theology. The next person is Tenyuku Malaliki. Malaliki rejects any view which suggests that Christianity is the crowning glory of African traditional religion. Jesus should be regarded as just another of the many other African ancestors. Therefore, the possibility is not only for Jesus to become the supreme ancestor, but he could simply join the ranks of other ancestors or at the service of the supreme being in Africa. As such, Meneluki fundamentally opposed any notion of Mobiti and others who argue that African traditional religion was a preparation for the gospel. Meneluki's contention is that African religion and culture must be given more respect by Christians. He holds that Bidiapo reduces African intellectual critique of the viability of Christianity in Africa to mere challenges for Christianity. And so he reduces African culture and African religions to mere preparation for the gospel. He goes on to label as dishonest and futile any attempt to discover a new and better African Christian theology using Bidiapo's approach. In his arrogance, Maluki attacks the elevation of Jesus to the role of supreme ancestor. He asserts, we have no right to view everything in African life as waiting for Christianity in order to be fulfilled. He thinks African theologians can do better, but offers nothing himself. He does not develop this point. He fails to take note of his implication for historic Christianity and his proclamation. Moreover, he does not offer a constructive vision of the church in Africa. But how can he, when the Lord of the church is merely another ancestor? The church has consistently proclaimed a Trinitarian understanding of God. So to reduce Jesus to merely an ancestor is in fact to remove a Trinitarian understanding from African Christianity. Moreover, the Christian notion of salvation is no longer viable or credible. More importantly, it changes the concept of the Christian God. It leads to defective Christology and rehashes issues that were laid to rest at the Council of Nicaea in 325. Do African theologians really want to do that? One must disagree. Charles argues with regard to his five functional categories. With an understanding of ancestral relationship, it is possible to examine the inner life of God and discover that there is an ancestral kinship among the divine person. The Father is the ancestor of the Son, the Son is the descendant of the Father, and these two live their ancestral kinship through the Spirit whom they mutually communicate to as their ancestral obligation, oblation, and Eucharist. And finally, we come to the integrators. So we have seen persons like Peter and Wachuki who says, look, there's no relationship between the ancestors and Jesus. There could be no relationship. We see Andrew Wall who is saying, look, leave it alone. Let, it, let me wait until tomorrow to deal with that. 
And we see um, Brother Lincoln who is saying, look, we can't be giving Jesus so much importance. If he wants to be important, he has to be one of the ancestors. He can't just be the supreme ancestor. And then we have the integrators, what I call the integrators. One may discern that some African theologians take the ancestors as a serious theological category for reflection. John Kobe, Kwame Bidiapo, and others seek to establish categories whereby an assessment of relationship between ancestors and the Christian church can function to enhance Christianity and African identity of, of the person as an integrated whole. The epistle to the Hebrews helps us to rethink the meaning of the priesthood in order for Jesus to fit the metaphor. The earthly Jesus was clearly not historically a priest in the sense in which that would have been literally understood within Judaism of the day. Nevertheless, to the author of the letter of Hebrews, Jesus was not only a priest, but he was the only true priest. Bidiaka convincingly shows how the theological method used in the letter to the Hebrews can help the church in Africa reinterpret Jesus in light of its experiences. Bidiaka asserts, if the God of the African pre-Christian tradition has turned out to be the God of the Christians, then it is to be expected that he has not left himself without testimony in the past. God did speak to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. As this relates to the ancestors, Bidiapo describes the phenomenon as the myth-making imagination of the community. In this regard, he may be more disposed to the notion of ancestors as memory rather than presence. Nonetheless, he is clear that African theologians must give a solid intellectual defense for any reference to Jesus as ancestor. One such person is Charles Enyamati. We have mentioned his theology, his Trinitarian formulation and categories above. John Kobe suggests perhaps the most potent aspect of Akan religion is the cult of the ancestors. They, like the Supreme Being, are always held in deep reverence, even worship. Kobe makes the claim for Jesus as the great ancestor, but acknowledges that Jesus does not just fit into the Akan concept of ancestor because every image is bound to be partial or half-truth. He rightly asserts, an African who affirms that Jesus is Nana also should relate that message to the issue of human and social justice in African countries as in the rest of the world. Hence, one needs to reflect theologically on the issues of the ancestors. He does suggest that Christ's sinlessness and frequency of prayer to the Father offers fertile ground for such theologizing. Alongside Kobe, there are many other attempts at African Christi Christology. Several images and names are bound for Jesus as, a, as ancestor. They include Elder Brother, Elder, Warrior Ancestor, Hero Ancestor, Ancestor par excellence, Jetty Ancestor, Proto Ancestor. Clearly, the notion of ancestor is the most widely used metaphor as a way of Africanizing Jesus. The metaphor tells us something real and significant about who Jesus is. On the other hand, it is Jesus who tells us what being an ancestor is. 
Christ as ancestor helps us to recognize our commonality. We are one family in Christ, one community. Unfortunately, the issue of whether Africans venerate, worship, or merely show respect for their ancestors require fuller treatment than can be done here. However, Charles Wanamaker deals adequately with the issue and points us to other sources. We know African people generally deny they worship their ancestors for historical reasons. Whereas some are of the view that Africans should be allowed to venerate their ancestors freely and openly as part of their Christian life so that they may be authentically Christian and authentically African. What is of importance is the role that ancestors play among their descendants. If Jesus is to be envisioned as an ancestor, it will require some correspondence between the function of the ancestors and Christ's own function in the lives of his followers. The church ascribes to Jesus an intercessory role and moral authority. Moreover, he is worshipped as the Son of God, a God whom we understand to be creator, redeemer, and sustainer of all humanity. And our initial contact is his incarnation and baptism. Clearly, Jesus' function reflects but not exceeds those of the African ancestors. And so the complexity and multifacetedness of the ancestors in African Christian theology has to be acknowledged. Yet, from Nawal Chuki to Kobe, there's a sense that the ancestors are vital to the Africanness of a person. Clearly, the ancestral tradition has slight variations among the Gay of Ghana, the Bantu of Southern Africa, and the Ibu of Nigeria. The variation granted, the concept of Jesus as ancestor is here to stay in African Christian theology. Generally speaking, Theologians work around the ideas of Jesus' humanity and divinity with differing emphasis depending on their point of departure. However, Jesus' ancestorship is premised on his incarnation as the meeting point between God and humanity. Incarnation is the highest fulfillment of personal of personality as understood by the African. For the African, to achieve personality is to become truly human and in a sense authentically black. Hence, the incarnate Logos is the person par excellence. There is therefore no genuine blackness or negroness outside of him. As an instance of fulfillment of personality in the African sense, the Incarnation is directly linked to the mysteries of the Trinity, Grace, the Pastoral Mystery, Pentecost, and how we understand church. It is the task of African theologians not to spend time developing new names for Jesus. Rather, they must theologize ancestors so that the naming of Jesus becomes the beginning of the process, not its end. The title places Jesus in the culture, but theologians have to continue the theological work of interpreting the title of ancestors for the church. It is the anonymous conviction of all African Christian theologians that one can be fully Christian 
without compromising the essential values of African culture. Just as one can be fully African without compromising the essentials of the biblical message. In other words, it is possible to be authentically Christian and authentically African at the same time. In fact, African theologians do not see this as merely a possibility, but as an imperative that leaves no other option. Hence, the concept of ancestor and its accompanying worldview remains particularly African. So Jesus, our ancestor, incarnates Jesus in African culture. In light of the revelation, of Je revelation Jesus becomes the Father's gift to Africa as Africa offers itself to God. This brings us now to how the church remains a profound gift from Christ to humanity. We are aware of the popular position that the church was founded on the day of Pentecost. The focus is not to dispel that, but to suggest that Christ founded the church during the course of his ministry in Galilee and Judea. It was he who appointed the twelve who became today perhaps and would be called teaching officers, who commissioned the seventy as evangelistic missionaries. Christ in so doing revealed his truth to a living company of people. Precisely because the message was conveyed in that way, it remains permanently new. Able to adapt to changing intellectual modes and social systems, capable of bringing forward fresh insights in different cultures as humanity changes over time. But a living body of people at the center of whose religion, religious insight is not a set of ideas, but a person has the very final capability of enduring through centuries, forever changing, yet remaining the same. Hebrews puts it like this, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. So the way in which we express that in worship and in our living can change. Over time, some features of, the, of Christ's truth may require to be accorded more significance than others. Or advances in knowledge and changes in culture may recast the manner in which the mysteries are formulated. Roger Hyde draws attention to the fact that the theological is not superimposed upon or laid on top of a closed set of societal phenomenon. The theological understanding of the church is not something extrinsic or added on in order to transform human structures, otherwise secular, but rather it is part of the very formulation of the community. The church has a responsibility as the community so formed to define and declare the gospel with appropriate images to the circumstances so that the truths implicit in the understanding of the first believers may, may, may become richer in meaning over time. And so there is a relationship between who we are as church and how we express and understand scripture. Because scripture embodies the gospel and is unable to stand independently of time and circumstances. Scripture has to be interpreted and explained. There are cultural assumptions which determine the manner in which the information they convey was established and that has to be interpreted. 
It is the living church that does this. And the process is a creative one. Once it is granted that scripture has different ideas and different cultural baggages, we must also acknowledge that the biblical writers work with certain assumptions. The scriptures will presuppose the revelation of God. That is, God enters into a relationship with us. The scriptural portrayal of Jesus presupposes that he is the Son of God, which is a theological point. Hence, the scripture is primarily theological and only secondary history. In other words, the Bible is a theological interpretation of history. A century after Africa's first evangelization by Europeans, the time has come for the African Christian themselves to appropriate the gospel message of Jesus. And so it is the responsibility of African church to read the scriptures as the word of God and to derive from it the essential theological point for a creative blend of African culture and the gospel. Only two ministers. To a minister. The conviction is that an ancestral reflection on ecclesiology will stress the importance of community and the cults of the saints in the church. However, it has Christ the ancestor as its ultimate foundation and focus. In other words, African ancestral beliefs require a Christological ecclesiology. Moreover, the relationship between the ancestor and the community is a two-way process. The community holds up certain persons as ancestors and it is believed that ancestors bless the community. Hence, the ancestors are dependent on the community for their existence. Theologically, the church remembers Jesus as its founder and depends on him for its focus and purpose. But Christ also needs the church to make him known to the world. Therefore, we cannot separate who Jesus is from what the church does, or how the church understands itself. My first question, and you may have, you will have, if you have any questions, you can ask. My first one is this: How much respect do we have for our ancestors? Some some Caribbean countries may call them national heroes. Remember I said earlier, they may have tribal, kinship, biological function. And so within a given family, they might hold up someone as the prototype of the ancestor. And so they think that that person impacts and affects their very living today. Is there any relationship between the ancestors then and our celebration of all saints and all souls? What about the Vincentians who say they dream the grandmother tell them something and believe that and, and make that determine what they do and don't do? And do you think that believing in that is incompatible with being a Christian? Yes. 
thing is that I know 100% different from what they were. When it comes to ancestors, you know, when they had ancestors and so on, well, they could say the grandparents and so on, the way you operate with them, the way you treat them, behave with them, everything like that. Everything, yeah, things have changed. They, they, they're not um, consistent as what they were, and they traditionally they come up. It's fading, it's fading away right now. It's not gradual. It's fading away. That's all I'm going to say. The ancestor problem. But I have a question here. Um, did Christianity exist in Africa before or uh, after the slave trade? Before the slave trade? Um, would it be a, a, a good question that people have it to find out if, if what religion they were? They were Methodist, Anglican, Pentecostal, Baptist? No, go ahead. They, those formulations are coming in now, but um, they would have, they would have been, for example, in, in Ethiopia, you have the Ethiopian Coptic Church, which follows an orthodox theology. So, in terms of labeling them, you could only speak about Anglican post the slave trade. You could only speak about Anglican post the slave trade. And Anglicanism is actually now the fastest growing religion in, in Africa. And, I, and Nigeria alone have over 18 million Anglican. But prior to slave trade, they would have been um, Coptic Orthodox Christian. I remember some of the earliest theologians were of, of African extraction. People like Tertullian. Athanasius, Augustine, they were African. The way they used to um, worship took a form of um, beating drums. Yeah. And it's about every piece of and um, keep it as like that is um, Baptist, this Baptist there. <laughs> yeah, because drumming has always been part and parcel of the African tradition. And those churches within Africa who maintained their original style of worship over against that which was introduced by the Europeans continued in that path. Because that, that, was, that is the struggle. That was the struggle in Africa. So, for example, when some of the missionaries went, they felt that everything African was not worthy to be used within Christian worship. So, they wanted the people, but not their culture. So, that's why I said there are those who said, look, African culture has nothing to do with Christianity. And then there are those who want to integrate. Okay, people like John Corby and Kwame Bidia. Okay. And that, that, that is a similar that is a similar thing that has happened, that is happening now. There's always a struggle of how to integrate, or if it is even possible to integrate certain cultural aspects with certain expressions of Christianity. Would it be safe to say, Jesus was a black man? <laughs> Can it be safe to say anything? Can it be safe to say that yet? I see. Alright. But what does it mean to be black? Because that, that would be the question. 
Because if we are this, if we are going to be defining blackness only in terms of skin color, then we would run into a problem. Questions, thoughts? The um, originally in, in Africa, you would original religion um, was ancestral and a lot of nature. Yeah. Mm -hmm. nature. So there were, as, as you point you know, the, the, these different um, theologians or, or, or with the yeah. theories of, of this different worship. Um, Christ, there were lots of Christians and still are lots of Christians in Africa. But a lot of the culture in, of Africa depicts anti-Christian things or anti-natural things because there are lots of beliefs of, um, you know, evil, obia. Even when we look at the movies and, and, and some of the, the writings and so from, from Africa, we see a lot of um, things and it would have been, but I suspect that because I have such multi-religious and um, Beliefs and so that 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 they were conflicting um mm -hmm. conflicting ways of life depends on you could go to maybe one one part of Africa and it's totally different. Right, right. Different I, I mentioned uh, Bantu, Southern Africa, mm -hmm. the Ibo Nigeria, and the Gay of Ghana. Mm -hmm. Um, it's the, the problem with the problem when you try to integrate. It is a matter where the emphasis is. It's a matter where the emphasis is. Okay, let me let us take a modern, and I'm using this because I see you here, Rosita. Let's use COVID. COVID as a test of who Jesus is. There are some people who say that you cannot, if you believe in Jesus, then you shouldn't be afraid of COVID. You shouldn't wear masks, you shouldn't take the vaccine, you shouldn't, you should just have, just live normal. Then there are those who say, even though you believe in Jesus, you still need to use your reason and follow certain um, given advice, medical advice or whatever. Science. Science, yes. No, I, I, like the, I like the term science. The science is always evolving. Because with COVID, you would, one of the things you would realize is that every three days, they were saying something else about COVID. Okay? So science is something that, that is evolving. It is not something that is static. So what but the point is, in terms of who Jesus is and how people see Jesus, that is, a, that is an example of where we have to, whether we stay with Jesus and he and he alone, or we try to integrate, or we do a combination of both. And it's a similar thing I'm trying to say that is happening with African ancestors. That African Christian theologians are struggling with what do we do with this practice among the Africans? That is so much a part of who they are. Do we integrate it? Do we leave it until tomorrow? Do we say that there is no relationship at all? Or do we say like my lady, look, all they can come in Africa and tell me that Jesus should just take over and forget about my ancestors. If you want to come and if you want to come in Africa, let him be another ancestor like all the other ancestors. She was looking at the Obia stuff for the African. Yes, yes. They're looking at ancestral behavior. They had their beliefs, their rituals, and they believed that the, the, the ancestors, the senior citizens, those who were passed they had some powers. Right. So, so they were trying to see how they could activate the power that and, was and if you if you remember I, this is what I said this is what I said 
Moreover, Christians don't emphatically deny that ancestors cause death and divination. A primary preoccupation of the ancestral covenant, and that it is entirely unacceptable. However, with these reservations, many theologians embrace or adapt traditional beliefs about ancestors. And so, because there is, I mean, there are persons who believe that they can fall upon their ancestors, they can kill somebody. So he is saying it is myth, and that the community is the one who sustains the myth, rather than presence. Because if you notice what is happening now, on our, we have our media, social media, and you will see when they are saying that they are casting out the spirits, and you see all things happening, and then you can notice somebody say they will to somebody or whatever. So I'm saying, um, how do I don't know how this will impact me, but it has to do with what persons are doing. And if I ever say you can do things and create problems. Mm -hmm. So what we are doing now is creating problems in the society that can affect persons all now. And yes. that is it happening. Affect them now and so in the future themselves. Today, you, see, the you see, the th what we have to contend with and any further research has to contend with, and I will give you that in the next lecture as well, is about how just by uttering an idea, you can create a, a whole different reality. Because if somebody gets hooked onto that idea and begins to live it out, and so that is, the, that is where the, the, the wrestling is. Okay? That is where the wrestling is within African Christian theology. How do we use something that is seemingly so much a part of the African life and help to reinterpret it in such a way that it can help them be authentically African and authentically Christian? So, for example, and well, this will come up under the, under ethics, but I will use the example. In many of the persons who became Christians were practicers of polygamy. And in 1956, somewhere about there, the Anglican Church said, look, if you come into the church and you are polygamous, fine. But if you are not, if you are not, you cannot become a Christian and then become a polygamist. If you come in as one, stay safe. We can understand, we can deal with you. But if you are there, you cannot become. Things have been changing drastically. The other Anglican minister here, who left and became a Catholic, Catholic priest, don't get married. And the priest has a cat a wife. Cat the priest now has a wife. Well, that was a special dispensation given by the Pope at the time. Okay. So the so the, the, when you when Christianity goes into a particular culture, it has to find ways whereby it can allow the people to be authentically themselves and authentically Christian. So for us, for us, for us, the struggle is carnival. 
uh, persons who go to carnival are technically Christian? There are those who would say no. There are those who would say that once you go to carnival, you can't be Christian. If you priest could play, who is me? Thank you. It is not about the priest. So the priest is only one Christian person. Is it? Yeah. Culture and yeah. And Christian. So the, the, the point is, because there are those who will see that there is no. No separation that you can be authentically Christian and you can authentically go to Canada. There are those who, if you want to see you go to Canada and see you in church, and they just call you devil. And all kind of shit. And then there are those who are still wondering. They haven't come to a definitive position as yet. To me, if you go in. Yeah, it's a cultural and explosion, yes. But there are some things in Canada that we want to call it culture, but those depend on this regulars as things that we should be doing. So, how so we such do as? So, we have a conversation. Right? If we're up there and drinking and in our um, exposing our temple, then what is a temple? What are we doing? Is we are doing against uh, what we should do. So, I don't see it as. Of being a Christian and being involved in such things, and then you go back to church, and then you are now in whatever you are doing. And I, I see it as something that should be not If you really truly believe, but that you're you are you are working with a particular understanding of Christianity. But if you believe, well, that is it. But you're working on a particular understanding and interpretation of the Bible. Right. That's how I'm working with it. But if we see it as just culture and say, oh, it's culture, so I'm going to, you know, to see whatever back. Well, but you see, not all, not all, and this is and this is where this is where this is where the, the argument is here. That's why you had four different persons having different views about the ancestors. Because not all aspects of culture can be baptized Christian. There are some aspects of culture that is definitely anti-Christian. And so you have to be able to discern that. Hmm? To be able to discern that. But one of the, I would want to end on that point. Because one of the things that we have to uh, appreciate is that no human being can be culture free. If you read a book, just like what I was saying on Sunday, and, and Nigel Thomas, to understand his book, you have to understand where he comes from, the context in which he's writing, and that all presupposed cultural impact. His book was about Jerome, who was, who was going on a journey of self-discovery. But his particular vehicle was the morning ground. And Nigel could only write about the morning ground because he's from St. Vincent and knows the spiritual Baptist religion. And that book was put up for a prize in Canada. If it was a Canadian writing about a journey of self-expression, they would not use that as the backdrop. Right? So none of us are culture free. So the question of who does theology and how are as critical in our understanding of that theology as are the questions of what, where, and for whom. These are vital questions that require some answers from our recent cultural context. For example, African Christianity was nurtured on a diet of importation, indoctrination, intimidation, and imitation. So the notions of the inspiration and integration lag far behind. There was, there was a time when if we had played steel pan in, in cathedral, shame would have been crying upon, upon, upon us at that time. 
No, if we ain't played now, something wrong. So use those, and, and that, is, that, is, that is the conversation I'm trying to get going, where we begin to think actively, and, and this, is, this is where I'm coming from. Do not hate or dislike people for their view. Seek to find a way to know what all the different views are, their strengths, their weaknesses, and finally, how do they relate and help to tell us who Jesus is. Amen. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Gracious and most merciful God, we give you thanks that you continue to reveal to our people your Son, Jesus. May we, in our own time, see him as he truly is, our Lord, our Savior, our Redeemer, your beloved Son, and the second person of the Trinity, so that as we continue to live out our lives within the orbit of the church, we may reveal and reflect who Jesus is for those with whom we come into contact. This is our prayer. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you all for coming. You get home safely.